or boards rather, we have time to take some reflections from you, the participants, and as always with conferences like this, we're down to about a third of our total number of participants. So you're the stayers, people whose travel arrangements didn't intrude into your ability to give time to this exercise. So we would like to welcome your additional thoughts beyond what we've asked you to scope in your sticky notes on the whiteboards. General reflections for about five minutes, if you have them, of course, on how you feel about the two-day symposium itself, how you feel about the symposium as a step along the way towards implementation of the National Women's Health Strategy, how you feel about it as an exercise in building relationships between the sector within itself and between the sectors and government about women's health. You might have some very negative things to say, you might have some very strong positive things to say, you might have some questions, but this is a chance for you to give us your reflections on your thoughts about any aspect of this symposium and its role in the National Women's Health Strategy. If you want to speak, please put up your hands and introduce yourself. Over there. Uh, roving mic is running on its way. Thank you. Adele Modolo, Multicultural Centre for Women's Health. Um, it's been a great two days. I think there's just been some fantastic work happening across the country and it's wonderful to be in the room, um, meet all the people doing the work and um, find out more about it. Um, I would really like to see a little more focus um, on the 10 priority populations that are listed in the um, strategy. I think um, in some of the work that we're doing, it's built in, um, but in the main, I don't think we're really doing that enough. Um, and in the summing up of the overarching issues, I think it really needs to be there. Because um, really, unless we specifically focus on those populations, we're not actually going to achieve the, that um, part of the plan, which is quite central. Thank you. Sarah Robertson from the University of Adelaide and the Robinson Research Institute. Um, love this work and I'm very pleased to be here. I really like the whole of life course approach, but I would emphasise that starting in teenagers is too late. We need to start in pregnancy, we need to start at conception and recognise that the health of tomorrow's women is in the gametes of their parents when they conceive in large part. And that also is a fantastic opportunity to work with pregnant women when they're really open to being able to influence so strongly the health of their daughters and sons uh, and to engage with them at that time to really translate into action this preventative approach starting from the very beginning that matters the most. Indeed. Thank you very much. Now, I know there's one just over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Deborah O'Connor from the National Ageing Research Institute. Um, again, sorry, um, again, I've really very much, I've been impressed and enjoyed the last, the discussion in the last couple of days. It's been very stimulating and uh, it's been terrific. But one of the things that struck me is that, and I think I mentioned it to Erin before, and, and I know you've considered it, the next decade is going to be, we're seeing the emerging non-binary people and population, and how is this going to be inclusive and um, has this, this strategy going to be inclusive and ensure that those people feel in, you know, that there is a place in these strategies? And one of the keys to that is making this a living process and document. So that's one of our challenges indeed. The next one is over there, BJ. I um, was reflecting on the fact that... Up this to your mouth, please. Sorry, this conversation began in 1989, I think was the first Women's Health Strategy. And then even going back to 2010, if you look at the four areas there, there are four of the six that are in this strategy. And I haven't heard any... What were the measures of success of the 89 strategy, the 2010 strategy, as in what was the point of them? Did they achieve their outcomes? Are we using that as a reference point? Uh, or are we basically starting at point zero? Because... All of these ideas, all of these things, I mean, at least even as a clinician or a human on the planet, I've been, we've all been having these conversations forever. And so, so, so number one, have we actually bothered 
to look at all of the massive volume of work that's been done in the past and the data that should be available if it was done properly. And number two, how, how is this one going to be different? Why, in, te in 10 years' time, will, will, will there be another group of people sitting here who are having exactly the same conversation? It's a great comment and question. And I would, after years of being in government and in the non-government sector, I'd hand it back to all of you. Governments won't measure other governments' performance unless they have a reason to be negative. Governments don't measure their own performance unless they have a reason to take it into a, a positive position for them. We have to measure what's been done before. We have to identify what were the benefits of previous women's health strategies and we have to look at what we can build on. We have that as one of our four questions. What can we build on? And it needs to encompass what do we know of what was achieved and where was it achieved and how was it achieved before we start to argue for new and different things or even for extensions of existing things. So that's part one of our pieces of work, I'd suggest to you. Other comments? Oh, just got distracted by all the other comments. I've <laughs> <laughs> forgotten what mine was. Um, yeah, so firstly, I'd like to congratulate everyone. I think it's fan it, For me, it has been... I'm also from the National Ageing Research Institute. My name's Bryony Dow. Um, has been a great opportunity to engage with some sectors that I don't normally engage with. Um, and so I think that cross-sectional engagement has been really critical and also the life course approach that we've taken. Um, so I think those are two good things that will actually... Maybe this has all been discussed and happened before. It hasn't, I haven't been part of it. So, um, but I think they're useful directions for moving forward. Um, I was interested, and this is a comment really, or, just a, or a question, in your use of the word peer in your uh, summary, which I thought was fantastic, by the way, um, we always talk about consumers in uh, healthcare, and I actually thought maybe we should start thinking about uh, peers rather than consumers, because that may more truly engage uh, people who are using health, the health system as equal partners or true partners. So... On a personal level, I'd be thrilled because I think consumers now has a value-laden message, which is your passive and recipient. And I think we do have to change the language, whether that peer is the right word or not. But if it has some meaning for a while, certainly let's use it. <laughs> now, just... Sorry, Jane. I really endorse and agree with all the comments that have been made. It's been an excellent forum and uh, I have found it a place of considerable openness and that, I think, is, is really great credit to the people who've organised it, that diverse perspectives can be put. My uh, request is a rather more practical and perhaps oversimplistic one, but I would really put in a request for person-first language in all the documents. So... There was a bit, we heard women with a bit, but we're still referring to pregnant women. We should always say a woman who is pregnant or a woman who's recently given birth or a woman with diabetes, she's a woman first. So it would be an advance if we could do that. Point taken. Can I then move on to, is there anybody I've missed? I am somewhat blind by that light. <laughs> Just one, one last one, thank you. Sorry, it's a very brief comment, but it's really to tie in with what Sarah said before about, and this relates to, to preconception health, but I think we actually have to engage men as well. Men have to be part of the solution. We can't just look at men and say that they're kind of irrelevant, especially if we want pregnancy to go well, childbearing to go well, and raising of children to go well. Men mm -hmm. have to be invited to be part of, of uh, what we do, and they need to be positively received, and they need to be appreciated, and, and, and you know, really told that they have a, an important role to play. Thank you. And now it is time to summarise what our next steps are. And as you can see on this slide, the next steps will be that the presentations and materials that we've had provided to us through these two days will be available on the Jean Howells website. 
with, we hope, hyperlinks to collaborating organisations and providers of those materials. We will be developing a summary report that will be provided to all, and it will merely give you a resource to both remember what was important here and think about how you take it into your day-to-day -day activities. Working groups will be co-established with organisations and individuals to address those issues that emerge from this process as the ones we should start with. So your sticky notes are going to be influential as well as the notes we've taken of the discussions. Quite likely, there'll be an early workshop around what working groups do we need, but that will emerge as we put the materials together. We want to keep hearing from you, particularly when you drive away, fly away, or whatever you do, you're bound to do what most of us do. Why didn't I say? Why didn't I think of that? Please write it down, not at night, and send it to us by email. And keep doing that as we build this process, because this has to be a participant process. It has to be a collaboration in reality and in practicality if we are to succeed, as Erin emphasised in the quote that she chose to use, together we are stronger. And that's absolutely true. When you want to influence policy, the more people with the same message, the louder it's heard. Now I'm going to hand over to David Lloyd, CEO of Jean Hales Foundation, to close the meeting. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for, th thanks for staying. Um, We've all been given work to do. I hope, VJ, that that is something that will characterise this over the next um, over the next uh, ne next few years. Um, I did have a few takeouts myself. I've, I've, that I, I agreed with all of the ones that you um, that you presented there, but just four things that I did want to mention myself, which just kept on coming back to me over the over the the discussion. I know it's a common place to say that collaboration is important, and yes, we're, we're stronger together, but seriously, I can't think of a single thing that Jean Hales is good at where we don't rely on expertise from outside of our organization. It, it, it's really important, this. Um, and it, it's deeply embedded now, I think, in the work that I and my colleagues do at Jean Hales, and I think it characterizes all of the, the work that we're involved in. I do think that non-health people need to be in the room. I seem to keep on being at meetings where health people furiously talk about the social determinants of health, almost acknowledging them in the same way as, as Vijay pointed out, that we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and then, then move on. But they all involve people who don't in work in health, and they're never in the room. And, and so, so I, I would like, I think, over the next little while to see people who work in homelessness, people who work in superannuation in the financial industry. Maybe a bank should be here next year, I don't know. Um, I, I, I do think, anyway, that the non-health sectors are a very important part of this. I do think we should be really ambitious about pushing for structural changes in the gender inequalities that underpin most of the health inequalities for women, uh, especially in the workforce. I, I've, I have just finished early this morning reading Annabelle Crabb's quarterly essay, Men at Work. I commend it to you. It's a superb piece of work. Um, it, it, it's really important, this, and the more I think about this and hear people talk about it, the more I realize how deep-rooted that change needs, needs to be and how fundamental and structural it, it, it is. It's confronting, but it's kind of where we all have to go. Um, and finally, my pet thing that I've been going on about for a while, ever since we, we were involved in writing one, is the links between the strategies. Um, uh, I think there'll be 21 of them by the time we get together next year. I, I suspect none of us in this room, perhaps indeed no one on earth, will have read all of them. Um, I think that's an important point. Um, and, and I think there is a real opportunity here to make the National Women's Health Strategy um, provide some sort of, if you like, gendered connective tissue between all the specific ones. And I, I, I think that's very important. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to do that because the relationship between the strategies, um, as those of us involved on the preventive health strategy development now know, um, it has yet to be 
has, it, 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 it isn't finished yet. This is a work in progress. So we all have our own takeouts. But I, I think the key point I want to emphasize is this is the start, not the end of the journey. Keeping it alive, keeping this thing alive, measuring our success, as was, was pointed out, um, is, is, is going to be absolutely key. That's what the, oh, it's not up there anymore, the Women's Health Policy Alliance um, uh, is going to be for. Um, so a few thanks. Um, thank you for coming. I've held for years that the people who turn up are the right people, and I think the right people did turn up by definition. So, so um, thank you. Um, you came to the forums as well. When the forums were launched a couple of months ago, I had, I had three fears, well, well, hundreds really, but, but, but three of them, three of them to, to begin with. One, of course, was that nobody would come, and thankfully I was wrong about that. The other was that the mix of, of backgrounds and, and interests that we have, the real diversity of, between clinicians and consumers and consumer advocates and people in research wouldn't work, and it really did. Um, and somewhat absurdly that um, no one would talk. I can't help it, I'm an Englishman, and fear of unresolved silences seeps deep within my DNA. But I was wrong about that too. Um, so the conversation then, as, as, as now, has been freewheeling and constructive, and the desire to effect change and have something real happen um, is, is really palpable. And that came to the symposium. And during, during the forums, I remember almost seeing the Women's Health Policy Alliance emerge as a thing. I, I think I said to Erin after the third one, I think it's a thing. Um, we don't own it, nobody does. It's simply an artifact of our collaborative intent. And it's there now, and I think we should all, I hope we all over the next little while use it. Um, I have a series of other thanks. One is I do want to acknowledge our AV team who seem to have fought against some fairly, fairly, fairly interesting, uh, interesting um, uh, difficulties over the last two days. I think you've done a superb job, so thank you from all of us. Um, I should thank the Federal Department of Health who have funded us to be here and will again in the future, God willing. Well, maybe not God, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, um, I'd like to thank Amgen. They did a great job with their dinner last night, I think. Um, it, was very, it was really interesting work that they showcased, and of course they paid for dinner, which is, which is, which is very endearing. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my Jean Hales colleagues, um, Chris Enright, Di Collins, uh, Nikki Russell, and Cecilia Ng, who have been just doing stuff quietly and making, make, making things work. Um, uh, uh, Janelle Carrigan, um, our media wrangler, um, hasn't been here a lot today because she's been getting everything that we've been talking about and the survey on, uh, on um, the media, as I hope you'll see um, as, you, as you travel home. Um, I really want to single out Kylie Ukovic. Um, uh, she, she, her KPI for this was a bit like a preventive health strategy. It was like nothing must go wrong. There must be no trauma. Um, and, and there weren't, there was no trauma. It was, it was superb work that Ky Ky Kylie uh, has done. Um, on your behalf, I think I must, again, as I said I would, thank Rosemary and Erin and, and for the work you've both done. Um, I can say, personally, you've taught me so much about the translation of health policy, and your agile brains have made this whole thing, whole thing work in a way that I don't think anybody else could have done, so, so thank you. And I think that's all. No, there's one more person. <laughs> Um, so, sorry, that's a bit of an in-joke. Um, so, Rachel Mudge um, uh, has lived and breathed this for three months since the um, program for this forum started off as a terrifyingly blank grid on, on the whiteboard, literally 10, I think it was about 10 weeks ago, actually, and she added this to her very, very busy job and kept all those other things going, going as well, living proof that if you want a job done, you give it to a busy person. Um, and um, she had 10 weeks to do it, so all I can say is imagine what she'll do with 11 and a half months to plan for the next one, starting now. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you having been here. <laughs>